Good morning, Brian. And good morning to everyone who is joining us online as well. Uh, normally, when we start off these sermons, I'll, I'll start with a story or with a dumb joke or something like that. Um, today, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a warning instead. Um, there is a fairly high likelihood that some people in the room and that some people watching online will walk away from this sermon feeling just a wee bit offended. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing because if you go to church and you never leave feeling convicted or offended, your preacher probably isn't doing their job. At the same time, if you leave every Sunday feeling convicted or offended, your preacher probably isn't doing their job. There's a very fine line that I'm going to do my best to walk in the coming years, all right? Uh, but today is one of those days where you're probably going to walk away feeling a little bit convicted or offended, or at least many people do. It, uh, if you don't, then either you aren't introspecting enough or you're doing good in this area, and I really hope it's the latter. Uh, so there's your warning. You, you've been warned, and now is your chance to get up and, and walk out if you're not down for that, but otherwise we're going to continue in our series in Philippians. Now just a reminder that last time that I preached two weeks ago, we had a little bit of a um, discussion from Paul about how there's always an area in our life that requires improvement. There's always some way that we can better conform to the image of Jesus, right? We said it's kind of like a road trip, right? Like you're driving to Cleveland, right? My family always took trips to Cleveland. You're driving to Cleveland, you're somewhere in West Virginia, you're not to Cleveland yet, so you have two options. You're going to pull off on the side of the road and you're going to pretend you made it, or you're going to keep driving. It's the same way in our Christian life, right? We have to keep driving. We aren't just going to pull off halfway and say, this is good enough, guys. You're going to keep on driving, right? You're going to keep going. There's always some area you have to improve. And Paul's going to kind of continue that discussion today. In fact, his thesis statement, if you will, is in verse 17. He says, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example that you have in us. I love the confidence of Paul here. He's like, join in imitating me. He's talking to a fairly mature church, right? Like, we've established that at this point in the series. This is a fairly mature church. And he's saying, hey, you guys are doing pretty good. Do you want to do even better? Be like me. Like, that's a little cocky. It's a little cocky, Paul. But sorry, he doesn't just draw attention to himself. He says, pay careful attention to those who live according to the example that you have in us. So he says there's other people out there that live a life worthy of imitating. You should behave like them. All right, cool. So how do we do that? That's the question, right? How do we do that? How do we keep driving? What is some area of our life that we should pay attention to to make sure that we are improving so we may imitate Paul and those who are like him. And he's kind of going to answer that in the next four verses. Now, normally what I would do is I would divide this text up into smaller chunks and we'd read it and then talk about it and then read another chunk and then talk about it, right? That's normally what happens. Uh, instead, we're just going to read all the rest of the scripture today that we're going to look at because there is a few general observations about the whole chunk that I think we need to look at. I think we need to look at it as a whole and really understand the argument that Paul is giving us here. Uh, it's only four verses. It's not long, but I just wanted to give you a heads up. So Philippians 3, 18 and onward reads this way. Paul says, for I have often told you, and now say it again with tears. Now, he's about to make a comparison in these next couple of verses, so pay attention. I've often told you, now say it again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Pretty short text, right? Pretty short chunk. And Paul basically takes these four verses and draws a comparison between two camps of people. We might call them the godly and the ungodly. 
of the godly people, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. We await a savior from there. He will transform our body into conformity with the body of his glory. So basically he says, look, uh, uh, we, we, we belong to heaven. We belong to God. And one day Jesus will return and then he will change us. He will transform us, right? So that's what the godly can expect. That's how he describes those people. Then he has this other group, this group that we might call the ungodly. He says their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. And they are focused on earthly things. Now, what on earth does all of that mean? Let's just look at it one at a time. First of all, he says their end is destruction. And uh, I'm not normally like a brimstone and hellfire preacher. It's just not my thing. Uh, It's not my style. But when the Bible talks about destruction like this, almost invariably it's talking about hell. So, when he says their, their end is destruction, whoever this camp is, who are the people that he is describing here, uh, their, their end, where, where they will end up if they do not reverse course, where they are marching themselves is, is hell. Then he says their God is their stomach. And this is kind of weird because when I first read it, right, and maybe some of you are with me here, when I first read it, then I thought, all right, so it's something about like, well, they just have the, these things that they want to do. They, shouldn't, they have these like sinful appetites or something like that. Uh, and that's not quite what I think Paul, after doing a, a little more looking into it, I don't think that's exactly what Paul is talking about, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Uh, the, the third description here, he says, their glory is in their shame. And, and again, when I first read it, I was kind of like, I'm not exactly sure what Paul means here, but it seems like there's something that they're really proud of, their glory, right? There's something they're really proud of that they probably shouldn't be proud of. Don't know what that thing is yet. I think we can figure it out in just a minute. But there's something that this group is really proud of that they really shouldn't be. And then he says they're focused on earthly things. Now, luckily here, we're back to something that is pretty standard throughout Scripture. There's kind of an idea of like two different ways of thinking, two different ways of living your life. There's the heavenly, which basically means like you're you're obeying God's will. You're living life the way that God wants you to live life. That's kind of up here. That's like the way that you should live. It's the way that God designed you to live. And then there's the earthly And that's just kind of a shorthand way of saying, like, living the way that people would live if God just kind of let them go, you know? It's it's the sinful way of living. It's doing things that that benefit you or doing things that that you desire rather than doing the things that that God desires. So there's kind of two different different levels, two different camps. And you want to be up here, but some people live down here instead, right? That's that's all Paul's saying. That's That's a fairly standard image. Now, Looking at these, looking at these descriptions of the ungodly, it kind of it brings a question to mind. Uh, who exactly is, is Paul describing here, right? Like, we, we've termed them, just for convenience sake, godly and ungodly, but who exactly is Paul talking about? Like, is he, like, adding someone? Is he doing what, like, every NFL athlete does, where they, like, talk about someone, but they don't tag them in the, tr- in the tweet? You know, they're just kind of like, he'll get it. Like, like, is that what he's doing? Like, who, who is Paul discussing here, and why is he not saying who they are. I think he's not saying who they are because the Philippians, when they read it, would have immediately known, right? Like, when somebody, if you only hear a snippet of a conversation, like you're walking by, you know, in the hallway at work or at school or whatever, and you hear a snippet of a conversation and two people are talking about someone, about 75 to 90 percent of the time you hear that snippet of a conversation and you know who they're talking about, like immediately, right? Or at least you have a pretty good idea, like everyone's been there, everyone's done that. Paul's writing to these people. He's not trying to hide anything, I don't think. I think he's saying, just from the details, you know who I'm talking about. And by examining these details, we'll figure out in just a minute exactly who he is discussing. Uh, So they're in his destruction. They're focused on earthly things. Those are pretty clear. But the God's stomach and their glory is in their shame. Those ones are a little bit less clear. They require a little bit more more looking. So let's actually go back a minute to the scriptures here in verses 18 and 19. He says, I've often told you, and now say again, with tears. With tears. And I think that's actually a really strong hint. Because as you read Paul's literature, when he talks about people, when he talks about people uh, that do not follow Jesus, he pretty much has two modes. He's either extremely sad or extremely angry. Those are kind of his two modes. Like, Paul is not a man of many emotions, okay? (laughs) He's either extremely sad or he's extremely angry. Well, the thing is, often when he talks about pagans, about people who are following like the Roman cultic religion or uh, the uh, Greco-Roman religions or or whatever, local religions, uh, 
he's more on the angry side. He's more on the they should know better. God has provided them like they have no excuse. He writes that in Romans, right? He says that God has provided us with evidence so that no one would be uh, with, with excuse. So when he says with tears, we should probably understand he's not talking about pagans. He's not talking about people who worship like the, the Greco-Roman gods. He's normally a little bit more aggressive when he talks about those people, that they should know better. Um, and when he says with, with tears, this is a group that he has empathy for. When Paul writes with this kind of empathy, he normally is discussing one of two groups. He's either discussing the church, like people who truly follow Jesus, which wouldn't make sense here because he says their end is destruction, or he's discussing his people, the Jews. And that's the only group that really seems to fit here. So let's actually go back to that, that table really quick. Is Paul talking about his countrymen, people that he is related to? I think so. He says, first of all, that their end is destruction. And basically, the, the hint that gives us is whoever's being discussed here isn't following Jesus. Whoever's being discussed here isn't following Jesus. So it could be pagans, could be Jews, whatever. They aren't following Jesus because their end is destruction. But then he says, their God is their stomach. And if you bear with me for a second, if he's talking about pagans, then he might just be using some really weird language that he's never used anywhere else to talk about having some sort of like sinful appetite. But that's not very likely. People normally have a writing style and more or less stick to it. There's some variation, but we'd have to assert that Paul's wording something he said a hundred times that people who don't follow Jesus have sinful appetites, uh, that he's wording it in a new way that he's never used before. That doesn't, that doesn't normally work that way. The other alternative is that Paul's saying something that he hasn't said before. Their God is their stomach. If he is indeed talking about Jewish people, he could be alluding to dietary restrictions. The Jewish people, because of the Old Testament, have extensive dietary restrictions. You don't eat certain things on certain feast days. You don't eat certain things at all. You must drain all the blood out of meat, things like that. And there is a group, not just of Jews, because Paul doesn't tend to warn the church against just practicing Jews, because frankly, while they might uh, have certain like legal uh, proceedings against the church, they usually don't pose too much of a threat to the church, right? And they, they went after Paul because Paul was a pretty notable person, but for the most part, Paul doesn't really worry about like, you know, the Sanhedrin out there in Jerusalem. He just doesn't bother with them too much, but there was a group of people you might hear referred to as Judaizers, who were born and raised Jewish and then decided to follow Jesus. They converted to Christianity. And Paul was very concerned with this group. Now, this is not all Jewish Christians. Paul himself was a Jewish Christian. All the apostles were Jewish Christians. That's not who we're talking about. We're talking about a group of Jewish Christians that decided when they converted to Christianity that you had to follow all the requirements in the Old Testament. You had to be a good Jew to be a good Christian and they undermined the authority of the apostles. And Paul wrote about these guys a lot, and one of the hallmarks of them is that they required Christians to follow Old Testament dietary restrictions. That you would eat the same way that a Jew would eat. The second thing that they were known for emphasizing was circumcision as a religious rite. So let's move on to that third one. Their glory is in their shame. There's a little bit of a pun here, because that word glory is substituted in certain poetry for God's name. So he kind of says their God is their stomach, their God is in their shame. But there's a little bit of a pun. It's kind of hard to represent in English, though. Uh, but their glory is their shame. Something that they're proud of, they should actually be ashamed of, is the idea being communicated here. And that's probably an allusion to circumcision. Circumcision was something that Jews were very proud of because it was a marker. It was, it was almost like you had been tattooed, as it were, with something that says, I am a follower of Yahweh. And so it's something that they are very, very proud of because it, it, it notes them as a follower of God, as a special people that God really, really likes, that really he takes pride in. So they were very proud to be the people that were circumcised. They were, they were proud of it. They gloried in it. But in the New Testament, after Jesus' death and resurrection, circumcision is no longer required. It's no longer seen as a marker of the people. And so Paul says, you guys don't understand, you kind of missed the bus, because you're still practicing this old way of living, and you're adding these obstacles in front of people that want to follow Jesus, and you're glorying in it, you're proud of it, you're acting like you're the only real Jesus followers because of it. And in reality, the thing that you're so proud of, you should actually be ashamed of. You should actually be ashamed that you're behaving this way. You should be ashamed that you're adding obstacles in front of people that want to follow Jesus. So 
while we look at this, and we might call them the godly or the ungodly, or might even say, well, this is, this is clearly Christians and non-Christians. It's not actually what Paul is saying at all. A more accurate way of saying this is Paul is saying that, he, that there, there's a comparison being drawn between some Christians and some other, air quote, Christians. Because the Judaizers would tell you, no, 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 I'm a follower of Jesus. I follow Jesus. But they're undermining the authority of the apostles, and they're teaching something contrary to Jesus' teachings. So Paul's not talking about Christians and pagans. He's warning the Philippian church against other people who claim to be Christians. Now we're about to get to this part that might offend you a little bit, or that might convict you a little bit. So keep your ears open here. This is not an issue where there's just a difference in doctrine, right? Like, we're, we're kind of used to that. You know, one church might practice uh, one form of baptism, another church might practice, like, sprinkling. Uh, one church might uh, practice uh, communion every single Sunday like we do, and another church might not. You know, we have some denominations that say that drinking is wrong, and some denominations that just say, you know, just, like, moderate yourself. Uh, and we're used to these kind of, like, small differences in practice, right? But that's not, what's, that's not the, the issue here. Because these Judaizers, unlike us, had direct access to the apostles. They had direct access to people who actually lived and walked with Jesus. Which means, if there was an issue that came up like, say, oh, should we follow the Old Testament or not, they could just go to the apostles or an associate of the apostle and ask the question and get the correct answer. You see, you and I, we might get tripped up because there's certain things where, like, Christians debate and we just don't really know what the right answer is, and I think Jesus has grace for that. I really do. I think that Jesus has grace for that, but the Judaizers didn't have that excuse because they just could have gone to the apostles or an associate of the apostles. They could have asked the question. They could have gotten the right answer. So they had access to the correct knowledge, and what did they do instead? They rejected it. They said, no, 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 we, we know better. How prideful is that? How unbelievably prideful is that? They had access to the right answer. And they're just like, no, no, no. I, I know better. I know better. So the issue here isn't a lack of knowledge. It's not a difference in interpretation. They had access to the information. They had access to the correct doctrine. They simply chose to reject it. They chose not to live it out. They chose not to practice it. The issue here is not knowledge. It's obedience. The issue here is not knowledge, it's obedience. In fact, the difference between us and them, between people who are true followers of Jesus and people who are not followers of Jesus, is not just knowledge. It's an issue of obedience. You want to see this illustrated? One of the foremost scholars on the New Testament in the entire world is a guy by the name of Bart Ehrman. He knows more about the New Testament than I will ever know. He's a genius, just flat out. He's also not a Christian, and he publicly states that he's not a Christian. That's not like me like placing something on him. He states that he's not a Christian. Tons of knowledge, tons of knowledge, no obedience. You following me? The difference between a saved person and an unsaved person, the follower of Jesus and someone who is not a follower of Jesus, is not knowledge. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know what he doesn't say? If you love me, you will believe that the resurrection was a historical event that actually happened. That's important. You do need to believe that. There's plenty of evidence for it. If you want to have a conversation about it, I love that sort of stuff. We, we should talk. But he doesn't say, like, that's the goal. That's like a bare minimum that gets, that gets you to the goal. The goal is obedience. Yeah, believe in Jesus. Believe in his resurrection. Believe in his teachings. But you have to actually practice them. You can know all the information and choose not to practice it, and you're just a Judaizer. <laughs> you're, just, you're, you're a Bart Ehrman. The difference between us and them isn't knowledge, it's obedience. If you don't believe me, then maybe you'll believe another, uh, an apostle. <laughs> uh, James 4.17 says, Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is a sin. This is James, the brother of Jesus, so not one of the original 12 apostles, but he still takes it title of apostle, leader of, an early, of the early church, uh, writer of one of the books in the New Testament, and what does he say? He says, if you know the right thing to do and you choose not to do it, it's a sin. It's a problem. It is charged to your account. If you know the right thing to do and you choose not to do it, it is to you a sin. Now, this does leave a little bit of a gray area, 
James, what if I do the wrong thing, but I didn't know I was doing the wrong thing? What if I just didn't have the knowledge? In many cases, that might be valid. But here's why I think that you and I should not hide behind that. Because in today's day and age, there's no excuse for ignorance. There's no excuse for ignorance, okay? In today's day and age, there is no excuse for ignorance. And here's why. Um, actually, two reasons why. The first one is because we have this wonderful system of holding information. This amazing system that all of us have access to on these little computers that we carry around in our pockets. The ones we have at home. You know, this thing called the internet. Do you know that Berean uploads all of our sermons, and this video that we're recording right now will be uploaded onto the internet. That's right, you can go back and you can watch it at any time. We also upload Wednesday devotionals, and we are one of hundreds of thousands of churches that do stuff like this. We provide teaching for free, entirely free, <laughs> online. We have this wonderful resource called the internet. Now, some of you guys might look at me and go, Jason, just not really an internet person. You know, it just kind of, that, that age kind of passing me by. That's okay. That's okay, because there's a, second, there's a second reason why there's no excuse for ignorance in our day and age. Um, there's these wonderful things. Sometimes they're kind of hard on the outside. Sometimes they're kind of soft on the outside, kind of flexy. Uh, they can be really small or they can be really big. They can be really cheap or really expensive. Um, but they contain these things we call words, <laughs> written words. What are those called? Oh, yeah, books. Books. We have access to more books, whether they're electronic or physical. We have access to more books than people 200 years ago or 400 years ago or 500 years ago ever would have thought possible. Because for the majority of human history, reading and writing was either impossible or it was reserved for the rich. And now we can all do it, at least in this country, nearly everyone can. There are books full of teaching about scripture. So obviously you have the Bible. Everyone should have a Bible or several and you should read that. But there are also books about the Bible. Did you know that? All sorts of different books. Devotional books and commentaries and uh, different books about certain Christian subjects or certain doctrines. There's a whole industry built about writing books about the Bible. They are full of teaching. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. You need some wisdom to kind of discern who you should listen to and who you should challenge, right? But between books and the internet, there's really no excuse for ignorance anymore. You see, 400 years ago, somebody might be able to look at their pastor and say, you know what, the reason why I've never learned, why I've never learned more about Jesus is because my pastor never, never taught me. Or the Christian way of saying that is like, I'm not being fed, right? That's like the Christianese way of saying it. I'm not being, my pastor's not feeding me. And it's like, all right, well, you're not a baby bird, <laughs> right? Right? Like, it, it is my job or if you normally attend a different church, then it is your pastor's job in part to feed you, to give you knowledge. But if your pastor isn't doing their job, there are so many resources out there that you can go to, that you can take and you can learn and you can grow. And then what's the most important step? You can apply to your life. You can become more obedient. There is no excuse for ignorance in our day and age. There isn't one. Which means... If you're someone who's been in the pews for a few years or for a few decades, and if you're honest yourself, you look back at yourself from a few years or a few decades ago when you came to Jesus, and there's no discernible difference between your life then and your life now, your behavior hasn't changed, your thoughts haven't changed, right now you might be dangerously close to falling into the same category as the Judaizers, as the Bart Ehrmans of the world. Obedience is that important. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, right? Obedience is that important. But I have good news for you. If you're sitting in that camp, you can change that today. You can change that today. You can say, you know what? I haven't grown. I haven't learned. I haven't applied my knowledge to my life. You can change that today. And the first step is, well, acquiring the knowledge to apply, right? So uh, here's a few resources I want to make you aware of. How'd that get in there? <laughs> like I said, we upload all of our sermons every single Sunday. Wednesdays we have devotionals. We're coming out with another video series that uh, Russ and Abby are helping me with uh, that'll teach you how to read and interpret your Bible so you can actually read the Bible for yourself, and it'll actually make sense to you. It'll be great. On top of that, if you decide, you know what, uh, I need more than just video teachings, and listen to me carefully, you need more than just video teachings, okay? 
we have small group ministry. Some are already going and some are starting up. Uh, some of the younger guys in the congregation, we meet every other Thursday. If you're not involved with that and you want to be involved with that and you are a younger guy, then let's go. Like, talk to me. I'll, I'll get you involved. If you're a little bit older guy, then Mike and a few other people are starting to get in, uh, start up a, a Bible study that will be meeting regularly. I'm not sure if it's going to be every week or every other week at this point, but that's getting started soon. So go pester Mike and he will get you involved. If you are a lady in the congregation, well, lucky you, because Abby has restarted WOW, which is meeting on Mondays, and I believe you guys are going through the book of Malachi, correct? Yeah, and that's like a dense book, right? Like, it's hard to read, but you get to go through it with someone who knows what they're talking about, and you get to learn together, and you get to grow together, and you get to grow in obedience, and grow in knowledge, and you get to, I don't know, be part of that camp that are citizens of heaven, rather than being part of that camp that is destined for destruction. Not my words, Paul's words right? In addition to that, we might have another group for women opening up um, relatively soon. I'll give you more details on that, or the church will give you more details as we move forward in that process. So for you and your family, there are three or maybe four groups just here that you can access, plus all of our online teachings. That sounds like a good place to start, yeah? Now some of you, because you're intellectual, right? You want to go a little bit deeper, so let me point you to my two favorite theologians. Um, Not a sponsor, no one sponsors us. We aren't sponsored by anyone. Um, the first one is N.T. Wright. Uh, he's a former Anglican bishop. He's a research fellow at Oxford, actually. Dude's a, a, an absolute genius. New Testament expert, Pauline theologian, uh, author of dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of books. He has a lot of free stuff online. He's a terrific resource. This is my go-to guy for the New Testament, all right? He, he's an expert in that field. Uh, so if you want to look more into the New Testament, N.T. Wright, he's your guy. Second one is Tim Mackey. Tim Mackey is the uh, hipster, like, Portlandian pastor that every Bible college student wants to be. Just look at him. Yeah, like, you know that dude always has a latte in his hand, right? (laughs) I want to be Tim Mackey when I grow up. Um, Anyways, he's he's my go-to Old Testament guy. Uh, He's an expert in Semitic languages. Uh, He's co-creator of the Bible Project. You guys might hear these, like, descriptions of these people and be like, no, that's too much for me. Tim Mackey creates videos that we play for our high schoolers at Bash. So you can approach his material, right? It is, it is understandable for normal people. That's one of the reasons why I love his stuff so much. He, he's approachable, right? So this is someone that you can go to. This is someone that you can understand. He explains very deep subjects in a very understandable way. And actually, N.T. Wright has that exact same talent. So those are my two go-tos, N.T. Wright and, and, and uh, Tim Mackey. If you go to these guys, they, they will teach you. But then it is your responsibility to take that knowledge and apply it, right? Because if you have all the knowledge in the world and you never use it, you never apply it to your life, you never change the way you live to honor Jesus, then, well, you're a, you're a Judaizer. Now, I, I would stop the sermon right here, but unfortunately for you guys, um, we have a little bit of, uh, of time left. So I actually want to go back and I want to I point something out to you guys that I think is a beautiful image. And then we'll end, we'll end with a prayer. Um, when we look at this description uh, of the Christians that really follow Jesus and the people that claim his name and, and they don't actually follow him, that first description there, it says, our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, a more literal way to, to translate what, what's said in the Greek is, um, our government is from heaven. And the word used there for government, uh, it appeals to a Roman system where they would uh, capture a city and then they kind of look at the city and they'd say, Um, we really don't want these people to rebel. In fact, we want them to kind of become like good Romans, and and we kind of need to inoculate them with Roman culture. And so they would declare the city a colony, and they would grab a couple hundred soldiers, and they would grant them citizenship, because in the Roman Empire, citizenship was, was a big deal. Not everyone was a citizen. In fact, most people that lived in Rome weren't. It gave you special legal rights and stuff like that. Uh, you could run for office, you could own property, all sorts of fun things like that. So they'd grant Roman citizenship to three or four hundred retired legionnaires, and then they'd plant them in the city. And the idea was, by having good, loyal Romans there, they will spread Roman culture to the rest of the city. When they have kids, they will produce more citizens. They'll inspire other people to try to attain citizenship. They'll make the city more loyal. They will transform the city into a little Rome. And Paul uses this terminology to describe the church. Because we are citizens of heaven. 
and we've been planted together in a little colony called a church. And our goal is to infect those around us. That's a really, like, vivid term in today's, isn't it? Infect. Anyway, our job is to infect those around us with the culture of heaven, to make little heavens where we are by spreading the culture of heaven, heaven's way of living life and loyalty to Jesus to other people. But we can't do that if we don't learn to obey. So here's the hard question. When you look at this description, with everything that we've discussed today, which side of that middle line are you on? And what are you going to do to make sure that you're on the correct side of the line? That's the hard question for us today. Now, you guys are thoroughly concerned, thoroughly worried. I want to pray for you all, okay? Lord, Lord, we come to you, as always, grateful. Grateful that you hear our prayers, grateful that you want to interact with us, grateful that you give us chance after chance after chance, no matter how often we mess up. Lord, Lord, I want to thank you for difficult passages like this. I want to thank you for difficult teachings that make even the most mature among us pause and think and ask, where in our lives have we failed to be faithful to you? Where have we learned or had the opportunity to learn and still failed to be obedient to your teachings? Lord, for everyone in this room and everyone joining us online as well and everyone that will see this message later, I pray that you will convict us of areas where we have failed you and that you will give us the strength and the perseverance to continue forward, that you would help us to stand on the shoulders of spiritual giants so that we would learn to be more like you. That we would take everything that we have access to, the books and the internet teachings and teachings in person at church and small groups and everything else, and that all of those tools would function to transform us into your likeness. So every day we would be a little bit more like Jesus, that we would cast off sins that we have struggled with for years, and that we would find ways to proactively be a boon to our communities. God, we love you and we want to obey you. We don't want soft, weak Christianity that costs us nothing. We want to be true followers and disciples of you. So thank you for this challenging teaching today. Thank you for this reminder, and thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We know that we don't deserve it, and we love you for offering us that opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray, and for your glory we pray. Amen.